One of the delights uh, in serving as uh, in this role is to be able to introduce uh, friends to uh, friends. Uh, and this morning, we just have an, uh, an astonishing opportunity to hear from the, the prominent scholar of missions uh, in our church. And I want to introduce her to you. Uh, Dr. Dana Robert is the Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and the History of Mission and Director of the Center for Global Christianity and Mission at Boston University. Uh, she teaches the history of mission, world Christianity, African studies, and mission theology. Her book, Christian Mission, How Christianity Became a World Religion, is now in its 12th printing. It is regarded as the standard text in this field. Uh, she is an active layperson of the United Methodist Church and active in her local church. Amen? Um, she is a graduate of Louisiana State University. Uh, and then she... <laughs> someone, here from, someone here from Louisiana, or not. Uh, and she earned three degrees from Yale University, including her PhD, and there she was a student of Henry Nowen. Uh, Dana is just a remarkable person. Uh, our focus is on mission together, and we come not only to do the work of the annual conference, not only to hear about what we are doing, but we sit in these chairs to learn. And so for the next few minutes, we have the opportunity to go deeper about what God's mission is for us. So would you welcome Dr. Dana Robert. Good morning. It's a thrill to be here with all of the United Methodists in Florida. And I bring you greetings from the oldest United Methodist Seminary in the United States, the Boston University School of Theology. This is the school of such diverse Christian leaders as Norman Vincent Peale, Georgia Harkness, Carl F.H. Henry, and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Boston is the place where 150 years ago, Methodist women organized what became now United Methodist Women. And I guess down here near Tampa, I don't have to mention the 2018 World Series champions, the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> and they're coming here tonight, I think, right? Well, now that I'm done bragging, um, yeah, I'd like to thank Bishop Carter for inviting me to the conference. But to talk about mission here is like carrying coals to Newcastle or running the sprinkler while it's raining. This conference has one of the most impressive commitments to mission of any part of our connection. So my role today as teacher is not to tell you what to do, it is simply to encourage you. We often forget that to be an encourager is one of the spiritual gifts of Romans 12, 8. So I want to start by thanking all of you for the many ways that you are in mission. So in my talk then, I'd like to reflect on what the together part in the title of this year's conference theme on mission together might mean. These days, the together part of mission might be the toughest part we face. We all know Christians are severely divided by politics, opinions, race, culture, and even by theology. Studies show that loneliness is one of the top problems in the country today. People spend more time looking down at their devices than looking into the faces of the people they see on the street.
Now, this lack of togetherness came home to me last year when I lectured at one of our United Methodist Divinity Schools. And in front of 150 people, a seminarian asked me whether black and white students could even be friends. He suggested that betrayal always lay at the end of the road of interracial friendship. Now, I was saddened by this question. Have we really come to the point where idealistic young seminarians cannot imagine that Christian community across difference is even possible? After all, God's mission is all about hope. And that hope is that collectively we represent a great multitude called out from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne praising the Lamb of God together. So today I would like to talk about Christian friendship across boundaries. This is one of the key but neglected incarnational spiritual practices that can undergird our life as Christian community. So my lecture today has two parts. First, I'll say a bit about the meaning of mission and the importance of friendship in it, and then look at the book of John as a resource for being in mission together. So what is mission? How does friendship fit into it? Just as a quick refresher, the words in the Bible that give us our word mission come from the word sending. We are in mission because God sends us. In our mission, we follow Jesus Christ into the world. And as mission theologian Andrew Kirk reminds us, the mission of Jesus Christ is done in the way of Jesus Christ. Discipleship, he says, is the test of our missionary faithfulness. So what does Jesus' mission look like? How do we follow what Jesus modeled for us? As United Methodists, often our definition of mission begins with making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This comes from the book of Matthew, where we see in the Great Commission, the, one of the, the first priority of mission is sharing the good news of God's love. We're sent by God to make God's love known in places where people are hurting and lost, through sharing this new life in Jesus Christ, we glorify and praise God together. A second major emphasis for, me for Methodists in mission is service. We're very good at service, I think. We follow the holistic example of our founder, John Wesley, when we do good for others. The God of love sends United Methodists to love our neighbors, to make the world a better place, and as it states in the second of our general rules, do all the good you can to all you can. So proclaiming the good news and service to others belong together in our task of making disciples of Jesus Christ. Then in following Jesus, we also follow him in Luke 4, where he talks about making whole what is broken. He talks about setting the oppressed free, and he's pointing to the kingdom of God here. The struggle for justice becomes part of our mission. We see Jesus proclaiming the kingdom of God, that, that time of peace and love and justice, God's justice. Now, when we think about mission together, though, what I'm talking about today is a fourth major priority for what mission means and that's where we can turn to the book of John as a relational framework in which we can talk about mission as building together a loving, inclusive community. The Christian community, its very presence, witnesses to the promises of God. Thus, being on mission with is fundamental to the nature of mission itself. We cannot do it alone. Relationships across boundaries stand as a witness to the way of Jesus Christ. And this is in contrast to a divided, mean world in which we know we are living. 
John tells us that at the Last Supper, Jesus told the disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. And this is the original model for Christian friendship. It comes right from the life and ministry of the human Jesus as he was in community with his disciples. As he prepared for death, Jesus expanded the new commandment with the words, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if I do what I command you. So we see Jesus' final reflections talked about this intersection of love, friendship, sacrifice, and community. So friendship comes from the life of Jesus himself, especially in the book of John. Now, as United Methodists, I would argue friendship is in our DNA. And here you see English theologian Jeremy Taylor, one of the people John Wesley admired, he wrote a popular treatise on friendship in 1657. And he said, even imperfect human friendships are a reflection of divine ones. Therefore, said Taylor, Christians have a responsibility to form as many friendships as possible. In the late 1700s, when faced with the suffering of displaced people moving from the countryside into the cities to hunt for work, the Methodists of Great Britain started what they called Strangers Friends Societies, and you realize that the opposite of friend is not enemy, to, the opposite of friend is friendless. And in those days, if you were friendless, you just died and people didn't care. So the Methodists sought out starving urban poor people. Following the Beatitudes, they befriended them. They prayed with them, they gave them food and clothing, they helped them find jobs. So becoming friends meant loving the poor and getting to know them. And upper class Methodists didn't like this. John Wesley wrote letters saying, you have a duty to be friends with the poor. And he wrote to one woman who resisted this, he said, go and see the poor and sick in their little poor hovels. Remember the faith, Jesus went before you and will go with you. And here we see Wesley identifying the friend, key to friendship and mission, being together with Jesus in mission. Now, when I was a little girl in Bruley, Louisiana, we attended a little country Methodist church. We sang from the Little Brown Cokesbury hymnal my entire life. Those are my, that's, my, that's the best hymnal we still have in United Methodist. And... Um, there we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. Jesus is all the world to me. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. And my favorite hymn of all time, he leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought, whate'er I do, whate'er I be, still, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Now, this is all about friendship with Jesus. Being friends with Jesus, walking with Jesus, holding on to Jesus, safe in the arms of Jesus. This is a spiritual reality that undergirds our evangelical Christian faith, especially in times of struggle. But as John Wesley was pointing out, walking with Jesus means going where Jesus is going. For if Jesus is our friend, then we are by definition, holding hands with a whole community of friends. If Jesus is holding my hand, I'm holding his. If I'm friends with Jesus, I'm friends with all the people who are holding hands with Jesus. And this is where mission comes in. Mission shows us that when followers of Jesus walk beside him, he leads us in directions we would rather not go, into neighborhoods we would rather avoid, and to meet other friends of his 
we might not normally see. So to, so to be friends with Jesus, as scripture and our history shows us, means holding hands in a chain of relationships that stretches back to the disciples and forward to generations yet unborn. I always tell my students, when you think of mission, sometimes we just think of geography, but we must also think of the generations. Because if we can't pass down the faith to the next generation, which may be of a different culture than ourselves, we haven't done our job in mission. We haven't been holding hands with Jesus into the future. So Christian friendship, however imperfect, and they're not perfect, this is not just a private choice. It's a missional discipline. The hope of friendship with people unlike ourselves says who we are as people of faith living in anticipation with the kingdom of God. Now studies of millennials show that forming close relationships is more important to them than evangelism or service. Think about what that means for mission. I see this all over New England. There's a group in Boston called Unite Boston, which is young, young Christians who are starting fellowship, have fellowship dinners with each other. Hundreds of them worship together on Boston Common. It's because they say, we must form friendships with Christians unlike ourselves. That's what it means to be a Christian. And this is what is drawing young people into mission today. Now let me move to the second part of my talk, which is to talk here about the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John provides us guidance on being in mission together. And first is to state that obvious but neglected fact Jesus had friends. <laughs> he talked to them. He talked a lot about them. Willard Swartley notes that the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John contain over 10% of the usages of the words for love in the entire Bible. As Jesus prays in John 17, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. Being one... Is, is intimately connected with being one with the Father. This important passage from the book of John shows us how Jesus' union with God the Father was the glue that cemented his, the relationship of the disciples together. Stan Screslet notes that John is unique in showing how people came to follow Jesus through friendship with other followers. Sharing Christ with friends, says Gresslet, is what happens when followers of Jesus open up to loved ones or others and share their experience in personal terms. So let me look at three examples, and there are many more, but I want to pick three examples from the Gospel of John that are specifically about relationship and mission. The first aspect of mission together is to remain together with Jesus Christ. And I'm calling this, what are you looking for and where are you staying? So here we see when Jesus first called the disciples in John 1, 38 through 39, it said, when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him all day. Now think about that. The moment of their calling, God calls them to follow Jesus. They don't go running off. The first thing they do is remain with Jesus. They stay anchored together in spiritual formation. The answer to the question, what are you looking for, was to find where Jesus is staying and remain with him. The meaning of friendship in the book of John is revealed in the author's repeated use of the verb mino, meaning to remain, stay, abide, live, or dwell. And over half the occurrences of this word in the New Testament come from the Johannine tradition. 
To remain in relationship represents the communion of the Trinity and between the linkage between humanity and God. And in one of my favorite verses here, of course, about this is from John 15, where Jesus says, abide in my love. And this idea of abiding can be used in multiple ways. Jesus is fully present to his disciples, and it's also the solidarity of humanity that characterizes the incarnation. So to follow the way of Jesus Christ together means modeling this relationship of abiding and remaining. Stories of mission, I think, show us that the most important missionaries were not those who ran to and fro. They were those who remained grounded with the people that they love. So to see the meaning of mission as friendship, go look at a cemetery. People around the world have erected monuments to the missionaries who came from other places to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Now we've just had Memorial Day and the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I challenge you next year on Memorial Day, go to the grave of a parent in faith, someone who in mission has passed down the faith from generation to generation. My Baptist friend, Catherine Allen, shared a moving story she heard from Baptist women in Moldova. A, a Baptist woman named Hazel Ann Craighead founded women's groups in the Baptist churches, and she mentored them with, with, for leadership. She remained with them. One of her protégés, a woman named Lydia, was the first woman consecrated for ministry in that area. When the Soviet communists began severely persecuting the churches and drove out the missionaries around 1939, Lydia remained ministering among women's groups. She was eventually captured and sentenced to death and sent to Siberia for 15 years. Many Baptist women leaders in Moldova died in prison under the communists. And yet, the women's groups remained faithful. They remained there. And after the communist regime, after the Iron Curtain was torn down in 1989, Anna circles resurfaced in Moldova. Now, no one knew why were these called Anna circles. It turns out they were named after Hazel Anna Craighead. The women kept their small circles of faith named after this woman missionary who had brought them the gospel and remained with them. And today, as Baptist women in the U.S. reconnected with women Baptists in Moldova, they had these Anna circles as a form of remaining. Herein, lies the paradox of mission. Those who travel to and fro, as important as they are, often get more attention than those who commit to remaining in relationship with particular groups of people. Anyone who has worked with children knows stability, remaining, connections, faithfulness, that relationship and friendship is what it means to be in mission with children. So being in mission together means building relationships with. And Jesus asks, what are you looking for? The answer, be fully present, grounded in Jesus. Through him, the people he's holding hands with remain with them. Now, a second aspect of our mission together is to build mutual relationships with those we seek to serve in mission, and I call it, I'm calling this, give me a drink. Among Jesus, not that kind of drink. These are Methodists. Okay. <laughs> Among Jesus' many encounters in the book of John, one of the most surprising is his conversation with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. 
Being from the northern province of Galilee, Jesus had to pass through Samaria to go home. He sat down by a well. When a Samaritan woman approached, he asked her for a drink. Now, we don't pay a lot of attention to that part of that wonderful story. But in that request, Jesus is crossing boundaries of gender, ethnicity, religion. And the woman's reaction is to say, how that you, a Jew, ask of a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Now, the point I want to make about this rich story is that when Jesus sat down, he asked her for help. That meant he could enter into a relationship of mutual exchange. He assumed she had something to offer him. In our cross-cultural outreach, especially to the poor, Americans often focus on bringing in stuff to help others. But this story is now not about a squad of well-equipped disciples descending on a village in Samaria bringing stuff. This was Jesus in a cross-cultural relationship. He walks in empty-handed. He says, give me a drink, please. I hope he said, please. <laughs> but his request for water opened the door through which he entered her reality and led to that deeper exchange about the, the living water. Now, one of the things I find the hardest when I go to Zimbabwe regularly is to accept things from poor people. I want to remain in control. I want to be the one who gives out things. I feel guilty when they give me a rich American things. But if we take the Gospel of John seriously, we see that the mutuality of friendship only becomes possible when we're vulnerable enough to receive. <clears throat> My former pastor tells the story of when he was a boy in rural Kentucky. His father was a Methodist minister. Every week, the church took turns inviting the pastor and his family over for lunch. Those were the days, right? <laughs> um, one family in the church was very poor. They lived on a farm, small farm, in a holler and grew their own vegetables. They had no money, but they wanted to invite the minister's family over. The poorest family in that parish wanted to take their turn entertaining the minister. So when the pastor's family went, they sat down for a meal of vegetables, and the family brought out one can of Spam that they had carefully sliced and fried and served to the guests. The minister's family had to eat the Spam while the family serving it couldn't afford to eat it themselves. That's what I'm talking about. Firstly, I do want to say I grew up eating fried Spam and it's horrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> But, they, but that poor family served the minister's family fried Spam. To have refused to eat the Spam because the family didn't eat it, didn't have any, would have been to refuse their friendship. In asking the Samaritan woman for a drink, Jesus opened himself to her reality. He became a listener, a dialogue partner. And the good news starts spreading along a chain of relationships of knowing and being known. In fact, we see that Jesus' critics accused him then of being a Samaritan and having a demon. What was the result of him being friends with the Samaritan woman? He was accused of being a Samaritan. That's what friendship with Jesus gets you. In our mission work with others, do we put our relationships with people above our projects? That's the question we need to ask. I want to give one more example of what I mean by give them a drink. And here's the story from Louisiana in September of 2007 when this town of Gina, Louisiana suffered tremendous racial strife. 
Six African-American youth had been convicted of assault against a white student and were given severe sentences. So between 15 and 20,000 protesters came to the small town of Gina protest, protesting this unjust situation. The response of most of the town were to lock their doors and hide behind their curtains. But Nolly United Methodist Church put out a sign that said, open hearts, open minds, open doors, came out, met the marchers, and said, would you like a drink? Do you need a drink of water? How about using a toilet, the first sign of hospitality? So the, so the United Methodists of Manali welcomed the marchers. That presented a kind of a, a breakthrough. And the black and white pastors of that town decided to sit in solidarity with each other. They conducted a nine-week revival. And here you see the, the um, African-American pastor, Jimmy Young, involved here, blessing people in this interracial revival. They, they opened a coffee shop for youth to come together. People became friends across racial divides. They hugged each other in Walmart when they saw each other. The Louisiana Annual Conference prayed for interracial friendship and peace and healing in the town of Gina. Faithful friendships grew in Gina from Christian people being vulnerable enough to ask each other, what do you need and give me a drink? Now, it would be naive to think that friendship solved all the problems of interracial relationships in Gina, but it was a bridge of hope, a bridge of hope into a Christian community that we all believe in, of worshiping the Lamb together before the throne. The third dimension of being in mission together is to feel compassion for our fellow friends in Christ in the household of faith. And here, I'll point to where have you laid him? Now, we know from the book of John that the deepest personal friendships that Jesus had explored probably were with Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. Jesus spent time in their home, eating, talking with them, in John 11, it reads that Lazarus got sick and died. And by the time Jesus arrived, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. The text says that when Mary and the mourners were crying, Jesus said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come see. And Jesus began to weep. So the people said, see how he loved them. Now that amazing passage shows Jesus crying at the death of his friend. He entered into the sorrow and pain of human life. He walked right into it. God becomes human and walks right into our pain and suffering. Even though he knew what the onlookers didn't, that Lazarus could, be, could rise from the dead, he still accompanied the mourners in their distress. He didn't say, oh, don't cry, you know, it's going to be all right, I'm going to raise him from the dead. No. He walked with them. He suffered. He cried. So when Jesus asked, where have you laid him, he entered the depths of what it means to be fully human. And this gives us another insight into meaning friendship with people as mission. And this is called often accompaniment. Now I've put on the board here the words accompany, compassion, and companion go together. They come from the Latin root com, meaning together. So being on mission together means accompanying people, having compassion for people, being a companion with people. It requires asking, where have you laid him? It requires sharing grief, as well as the joys of worship, family meals, children's activities. 
Like Jesus, his followers must cry and mourn with their suffering friends and celebrate resurrected life when it comes. In January of 2010, a powerful earthquake hit Haiti and killed over 300,000 people and left a million people homeless. We already know how hard hit our United Methodist community was in Haiti. An alumnus of the BU School of Theology, a missionary, Jim Gully, was buried in a hole under the collapsed Hotel Montana for three days. The two, two of the other missionaries with him died. Then, like Lazarus, after three days, Gully was resurrected. He was dug out by French rescuers. Well, when I asked Jim, I said, Jim, how has your life changed by being buried in that hole and then rescued? He said, not at all. Because in my decision to become a missionary years ago, I was prepared already to suffer and die with the people that I went to. Where have you laid him? In asking this question, Jesus showed his solidarity with his friends. Many people came to believe he was the Messiah. No doubt they believed in him because he raised Lazarus from the dead. But perhaps they also believed in him because he cried. Because he sat there and he wept with his friends. So let me move to my conclusion, and it's really a simple point, that to be sent by God in mission requires being together, being with. And in the divided world and church we have today, we should pay attention to making friends over the boundaries, across the boundaries that divide us. In my talk, I've touched upon three things that are especially important for boundary crossing togetherness. What are you looking for and where are you staying? Friendship involves being grounded with Jesus and accountable to a specific community and places. Give me a drink. Boundary crossing friendship involves listening sharing, giving, and receiving in mutuality from those we cross boundaries to serve. Where have you laid him? Friendship involves suffering with, empathizing with the daily struggles of others in the household of faith, including the tough parts of life and death. So these encounters of Jesus in the book of John show that mission is more than traveling to see new places. It is more than short-term projects. Friendship in the way of Jesus is an incarnational practice of building a community in love and relationship with each other. Now, if Jesus had merely been a human being, his friendships would have stopped at the crucifixion. Maybe there would have been a photo album when people looked at pictures of Jesus and said, we miss him, you know, he was our great friend. <laughs> but that's not how it ended. The resurrection followed the crucifixion. Resurrected and glorified, Jesus returned and met his friends again, even after death. The book of John tells us of multiple examples of the resurrected Jesus appearing to his disciples, interacting with them in many ways, eating, breathing, talking, being interested in their fishing, showing, him the, his, showing them his wounds. So in the resurrection, you see, we have a kind of transformation of the meaning of friendship. Friendship, at that point, moved from the realm of our human limitations and we know that our friendships are limited because we are limited. Friendship moved from the realm of human limitations to that of divine possibilities. It, they moved 
from the boundedness of a specific location and a small circle of close friends to sharing the stories of Jesus across time and across space. In John 20, 19 through 23, when they encountered the resurrected Jesus, the disciples renewed their relationship with him. Their friend and master dead, the fearful disciples were hiding behind locked doors. Jesus appeared and blessed them with the words, peace be with you. He showed them his wounded body. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Their fear turned to joy. From abandonment came certainty. And Jesus said again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Through this physical act of breathing, he sent them out in peace. And he sent them out in relationship. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. With the breath of Jesus warm on their faces and the Holy Spirit to guide them, the disciples knew the relationship with their friend was transformed. It was limited. Their human limitations gave way to the possibility of resurrection, the reality of resurrection, and the possibility of friendship across time and space. In his chapter on friendship in the four loves, C.S. Lewis comments that while lovers look at each other, friends stand side by side. Friends stand beside each other because their eyes are fixed on what they have in common, not fixated on each other. If Lewis had lived today, he would have also said Christian friends are not looking down at their cell phones. (laughs) They're walking together toward a common vision. Lewis said, they see the same truth. He said, you will not find the warrior, the poet, the philosopher, or the Christian by staring in his eyes. Lewis says, better fight beside him, read with him, argue with him, pray with him. Now, Lewis's comments can be applied to friendship in the wake of the resurrection, and they apply to us today across the divisions in our church, across the divisions in our nation, and across the divisions in the world. Remaining fixed on the resurrected Jesus, their Lord and Savior, the living God, the faithfulness of the disciples to each other deepened. The life of Jesus with his disciples was the beginning of an expanding network of relationships that has cascaded down through the ages and is with us right here today. What a friend we have in Jesus. And walking side by side, being in mission together, means we are called to friendship with the risen Lord and with each other.